the topic. We are discussing people's lives. We are discussing those who have been wrongfully executed by the state, those who live, you know, amongst the kind of ongoing amount of surveillance and um, unlawful, but maybe even one would argue it is lawful because the law does it, um, sanctioned violence. And so it's important that we do not ignore that. And my fear is that this is a topic where everyone will try to just discuss the system kind of very sanitized, i.e. not really thinking about how is it that we are discussing um, this violence? How is it that we are discussing the legal system? We should not be just using these folks' stories, using these folks' lives just for the game that is debate, but have a meaningful conversation for how we got here. And why is it that when we say CJR, we're not thinking about white folks, you know? So if that's something that makes you uncomfortable, welcome. This entire topic should make my, my white folks a little uncomfortable, right? Because we are talking about a very real kind of situation slash reality that a lot of brown and black folks live in. And that's how I'm texturing it. If that's not what you're, what you're used to, well, guess what? It's 2020 and we got COVID. So gonna do the slideshow view that is clear. Siri calm down. Okay. So who is sorry y'all I've got too many Apple devices starting to talk to me. All right. So I said say their names in the topic. Here's just a list. So when we are talking about CJR, we have to think about those who have been lost and who are continued to be lost through these things that we talk about policing, forensic science, sentencing. And so I wanted to give you a visual look at this is just what this is just what has been recorded. Recorded being a very important word since 2014 to now. Wild. Wild wild stuff. And so I'm not going to list off, say, their actual names. You see them. You have seen these in the media. Maybe you're just like, okay, you know, my Instagram wokeness. I'm going to say I said their names. I'm going to put the black square. But these are real people who have families, who have, who have to deal with the kind of trauma of the law. And this is not something that is just particular to these families, but also to maybe your families to my family, it's ongoing, it is systematic. And so we are saying their names in the topic and how we are discussing this entire phenomena that is CJR. So where did it start? Well, the visual should give you a pretty good idea of what I'm about to say. And that is slavery, right? The kind of racial formation, so how we began to designate class and race and how bodies were used and how they were evaluated, all these different civil societies, so how the world works, how we know who has what job, how we treat certain folks, where the law should exist and where it shouldn't, was, was built and perfected during slavery. And um, I don't know if y'all have read the new Jim Crow, but there's a quote, we have not ended a racial caste system in the U.S., we have merely redesigned it. So when I have conversations with y'all about this idea of transformation, there is a very um, consistent correlation between slavery to now for the logics, right, of how racial caste systems have allowed for the CJR system to continue to this day. So we have the visual demarcation of this transformation. We have the slave house, slavery, to Jim Crow, this middle picture, to mass incarceration, preservation through transformation. We should not look at these things as isolated events more or less, what are the similarities and the ways in which the law, right, 
has allowed for not only these events to occur, but why? What was the value of slavery? What did it allow for? Okay, emancipation, we decided that, you know, uh, slaves should be free, if that's the narrative of the Emancipation Proclamation that you subscribe to. We get to, you know, reconstruction turns to Jim Crow. So we believe that segregation is the best way for these two social classes to exist. Why? What was the purpose? That, what was the value of that to the law? All right. So at some point we decided that separate is not equal and so that it should be combined together. Beautiful world, kumbaya maybe. But then the result of all this leads into mass incarceration, which is very singularized towards a racial caste, black folks, brown folks, who just so happen, question mark, to end up as the representative class in prisons? What is the value of the prison system? Why does it continue? What does it allow for? So historical lens, I've done some of that for you, that black Americans have been repeatedly controlled through institutions from slavery to Jim Crow, to the prison industrial complex today. And that the Emancipation Proclamation may have brought upon the legal justification um, for freedom, but it also at the same time of freedom kind of classified that freedom, right? So it's you may be physically free from chains, but we are gonna change the definition of chains to laws for detainment for laws for incarceration. We've heard of the black codes, maybe. If you don't have money, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just make it very simple, right? Is that during this time, it made it so one, that even when the Emancipation Proclamation was passed, it was not effective in all states, right? And so there was this question of where is the limit point to freedom and also, what does that mean for these now freed slaves in terms of work? They had not jobs, but forced, you know, locations that they had to work um, to justify their existence. But now that we have emancipated them, they, they now have to exist in the world as freed folk. Did that change the work or labor that they did? No, we know about sharecropping. We know about convict leasing. We know about all of this. This was the jobs, right, that Black folks were folded into through the fear that if they did not have an occupation, that that could be a justification to be thrown into jail. No job, can't afford to, you know, pay for the land that has been taxed off the wazoo, i.e. now Black people can't afford to live free, and the money that they're making is going straight back into the pockets of folks who are levying that tax, you can't pay that, guess what? We're gonna get that free labor in the jail cell. This sounds very familiar to now as we will, that we'll move, as we'll move through this lecture. Now, 1970, so I kind of have sped up a little bit because I wanna make sure that I get to the topic areas, wanna make sure that I keep y'all engaged, um, is that uh, in the 1970s, criminologists predicted that the prison system would fade away. Last time I checked, that there are prisons left, right, jails left, right, all around us. So what happened for criminologists who are specialists within, you know, the sociology of crime and political science to predict that prisons would go away to now they are overly represented? There's a proliferation of prisons and jail cells are being created every day based off of very racialized understandings of like education, housing, et cetera, et cetera. But they predicted it would go away because it didn't deter crime. Prisons don't deter crime. The National Advisory Commission on Criminal Justice Standards and Goals just this larger commission that dealt with looking through the information that criminologists were putting together through their kind of um, observations and studies. Um, it issued a recommendation in 1973 that the prison institution should not continue because it actually created crime. 
So remember when I talked about the black codes just earlier, that if you don't have the money to afford rent, let's just say that, that your the justification for, oh, then that means you don't have, you know, the better access to, let's say, housing. You don't have the money to have access to providing for your families. You don't have the access to provide for equitable um, health care, right? It's like now that you're unable to afford life, the justification to put you into a system that you can be used as capital, right, for very, very cheap, is exactly what we see here is that that produces crime, right? And crime, I want to put in quotation marks, right? Because it's very racialized for what is a crime that is, you know, accused and incarcerated versus what is a circumstance that is put positioned in society to produce disenfranchisement, right? Because the narrative is disenfranchisement siphons or gets rid of opportunities when you don't have opportunities that are intentionally placed by the law, what do you do? Right? What, like, what do you do legally? And those things become weaponized against black and brown folks. That the prison system presents created crime, created disenfranchisement, created a more strong hard line in terms of racial caste. Now, today, the U.S. crime rates have dipped below the international norm. So like, woo, you know, changes are being made. We have less prison. Okay, let's not get water washed in the narrative that is untrue. The U.S. boasts an incarceration rate that is six to ten times greater than that of other industrialized nations, which means that if we were to do like just math, right, I know that y'all I don't know where you are in high school, you've done some like statistical analysis, maybe, or a Venn diagram <laughs> of similarities and differences. Why is it that the United States in comparison to other industrialized nations, so concerns of like political um, significance, like are we doing it compared against like democracies? Are we doing it compared against like what does um, the economy look like? Very similar kind of scenarios don't have the as enlarged of a prison system as the United States. Why is that the case? I would argue that we have a historical relationship to promoting a racial caste system for black and brown folks that we have only, that, is, that has been our capital. It has allowed for, you know, civil society for the world to operate because prisons make money at the end of the day. But that's not to say that there's no kind of like racism slash anti-blackness in other parts of the globe. We are just focused in on prisons. And so then the war on drugs that starts kind of at the end of the 70s, puts us in the 80s, is also linked to this proliferation of inmates in prisons. And we'll get into that in a second. So this unprecedented growth, no prison uh, was popular amongst the academic discourse. So now when you hear abolition, that's not a new thing. That's not a new phenomena of folks saying that we should abolish prisons or we should abolish, you know, the police state. It has been very much so steeped in something that is proved by facts, proved by math, proved by whatever you need to like, you know, get away from your kind of racial biases that, but crime is so bad, we need to be hard on it because our world will just be so horrible without it. It is just proven that it does not eradicate crime, right? But rather supports a, lar a widening gap. So why is it that academic dis academics, pol like not politicians, but scientists, essentially sociologists are all agreeing that prisons are not effective and actually increase the problem. Why are we here? Why are we seeing growth? There must be something to it. And so, 1972, we had less than 350,000 uh, folks incarcerated. Now we have more than 2 million. I don't know if like y'all need like a percentage of the population test, but we have somewhere of 300 million folks, right, 
in the United States, 2 million. Can someone do the math for me on what percentage that is? Because it's a very large percentage of folks just who are in prisons. Not like just parole, not jails, none of that. We're talking about in the prison system all across the United States. These are who are incarcerated right now. Right. And that the civil rights, and someone had asked the question of, but then what about civil rights? Why like, were they pushing for reforms? Oh my goodness, Siri, calm down. Sorry, y'all. Okay, um, oop, ignore that for a second. But civil rights movement was definitely focused in on, right, this kind of uh, disparity in crime. But um, it was also focused on issues like affirmative uh, action, right? Because all these things are interrelated. So you're like, but like, why didn't that resolve these things? Why didn't that like, you know, you know, become the rallying cry for um, creating access and rights for Black folks? It was part of the argument, but nobody could have assumed that the prison system would be the way that it is right now because of all the observations, all the kind of sociological reports that were coming out, that crime was a factor of like economics, of uh, socioeconomic status, of resources that are poured into your communities. If resources are not getting poured into your communities and like there's a higher surveillance state there, what is going to be the outcome of that? Justifications to detain and put folks into jail or to put them into prison. It's a very perfected little system we got going on here. Uh, I like to call it a Molotov cocktail, if you will. Um, so getting into the federal versus state governments, who has legal authority? Um, it really depends on what statute you are accused of being in violation of. The vast majority of cases um, for being in violation of state statutes because the federal government heirs to quality of life and states which, you know, according to the 10th Amendment, right, when we get into like state rights and where there needs to be some type of distinction between federal oversight and states knowing what's best for their state, it's exactly that, that in order for the federal government to know the quality of life, it defaults to the states because the states are closer to the citizens, right? They're closer to their citizens in that particular state to know what, how should the money be moving. How should the programs be, uh, any programs, you know, that are run by the government, how should they be, um, you know, operationalized? Because the federal government is just too far back, right? They're too, they're focused on moving the money between all states and making sure that, you know, there is federal interpretation for a lot of these statutes. But in the context of enforcement and making sure that it meets this quality of life standard, it has defaulted a lot to the states that are more local. Here is an issue though, is that there is a gap in double jeopardy. This complicates kind of the federal and state charges um, and how they are treated uh, as completely separate questions. Now, federal versus state charges, what are they, Jasmine? How does this operate? A very kind of simple way to conceptualize this is that Basically, every char every charge that we see in the context of like criminal law. So if we're talking about robbery, if we're talking about larceny, if we're talking about murder, all of those things are first dealt with at the state level, the part of which it becomes a federal um, issue if it is interstate, right? So if it's, if it is between states and no one state can like you know, use their interpretation of government enforcement uh, because it impacts another state's um, kind of rules and protocols for such. And so now uh, there needs to be some kind of federal intervention. Larger kind of crimes that deal with like corporatism, right? So like the big corps, uh, that's a lot dealt with in the context of the federal government because white collar crime, a lot of the times isn't necessarily seen as criminal law, even though it still is designated within criminal law. It's just, there's a lot of um, rhetoric wise, they're not in cart, like they're not given the criminal, oh my gosh, it's more like, oh my gosh, embezzlement, that's horrible. Don't do that. Um, but things that are done by folks that automatically benefit them, those are kind of put more so in the state kind of charge level are dealt with by state uh, courts. 
um, and then interstate situations and then larger crimes that deal with kind of a mass of states or just like deal with like corporatism are going to be more so dealt with on the federal level. But um, as the government, the federal government can decide that even if you are convicted, um, uh, even if you are found not guilty of a crime in the state level, the federal government can pick up that same case and charge you for the same crime based off of whatever interpretation that they had, right, for why it needs to be tried at the federal level. So you're not, you're not, you're not done so yet. It's not game over. You could still be indicted and convicted um, based off of uh, the justification that double jeopardy does not apply here. Um, and so I talk about this with the, the last bullet point in terms of the overlapping, um, the commerce clause, um, and why states are given preference over the federal government, but it definitely gets some say so in the context of enforcement as it is the sovereign body of all the states. And if it disagrees with the state government or state statute, it can um, come with more, it, it can come with a secondary charge. And these federal charges usually are the ones where we hear like the, the life sentences, right? Where we get like the you are going to be charged for the next 30 to 40 years. State charges can do that, but a lot of the times we'll see that where these big lifelong sentences come from is from the federal level than the state level. Is everyone with me? Are we feeling good? Things are making sense. We're like, okay, the topic. We love prisons. JK, we hate them. Hopefully I'm doing my job right. No, okay. Um, sentencing. So that first part was just to do like the federal state stuff, who has what capacity. Uh, if you are interested in like talking about courts, we can definitely do that just like in terms of like the Supreme Court, right? And like the distinctions between um, its level of enforcement versus like state courts and what um, is their kind of authority and how do they default to Supreme Court rulings, all of that. Um, is important, but in the context of time and what I have to get through, um, it can be a question that you ask later in the Q&A portion of this, because um, I do want to answer it, but a lot of my response sounds similar to what I have said about the federal versus state distinction. It's just, you know, the larger body, the Supreme Court has interpretive capacity because that is the jurisdiction that has been given by the Constitution. But like I said, questions about it, we can talk about it in the Q&A slash during the discussion periods of your lab. Um, okay, sentencing. So before I get into like sentencing, I wanna talk about some folks. I don't wanna say cases, but some uh, very, some stories, some narratives, some real uh, legal <laughs> realities of the state. So Centoya Brown, are we familiar with Centoya Brown? No, kind of, a little bit. Okay, so um, in 2006, she was a 16-year-old um, girl um, and was convicted of aggravated robbery and first-degree murder. The real story behind this is that she was picked up for uh, sex trafficking from a very trusted confidant uh, that at the time was trusted, but that um, in a dispute that happened between her and person, it got uh, violent. Uh, and him aggressing um, against her, and I, and also the fact that she was being taken up for sex trafficking and was a minor, uh, is probably why she definitely does not have the power in this situation, right? Um, and in that exchange, was in self-defense, pulled a gun out on him and shot him, right, for her safety. Prosecutors claimed for the reasons that they did, that um, she shot Alan, which was his name, out of a plan to rob him. Um, and based off of that kind of rule, she was sentenced, she was sentenced to life in prison. What world do we live in, right? We're in self-defense and also being a minor taken up for sex trafficking. You are being accused of a crime that justifies a life sentence. Um, so they found that they ruled that it was not in self-defense. That's why the life sentence was a thing, not that robbery gets you a life sentence. Um, it was that that was still considered first degree murder um, uh, and not manslaughter, uh, which 
we can, yeah. So the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that mandatory life uh, sentences without parole for juvenile offenders, and like this is where she was a juvenile, she's not 18, not an adult, not at all, uh, are not constitutional. But how was the Tennessee, uh, Tennessee courts, Tennessee federal uh, state courts able to do this? It's because they have a rule in place, right, that argues um, that she would not technically be on a life sentence. She would uh, be eligible for parole after 51 years. So like, because she's young and 51 years would put her at like what, knocking on 71? That that is not a life sentence and that the possibility for eligibility is what allows for it to be not seen as, uh, no, you're stuck in prison without a chance for parole, life without parole. Very wild, right? Because eligibility does not mean that you get or, or can become eligible for parole, but that that is the justification that the courts are able to use to keep her in prison on a life sentence. And the, I guess the yay part of this, and maybe where some of y'all are, you know, I have, I've heard of this case, is that a lot of celebrities took up um, kind of the attention for this and were like, you know, Rihanna, Kim Kardashian, and like a few other folks uh, were like, this is just not right. She was defending herself as a, you know, victim of sexual um, assault, um, was that she was later granted clemency that only, um, you know, the, uh, she was granted clemency, but um, she should have never been incarcerated in the first place. And that in the state of Tennessee, there are more than 180 people serving life sentences that were committed in their teenage years. So a lot of y'all are like 15 years old, right? 16, 17, 14, 13. If you were to defend yourself and the court ruled that it was with the intention uh, to assault someone else, like i.e. that they did not find that you were defending yourself, you could be serving life sentences in jail right now. And like, that's just what it is. And that is why the resolution calls for reform, right? Reforming sentencing. Why do we kind of uptick all the way up to these maximum sentencing laws? So mandatory minimum sentencing. Have we heard of this? Kind of, a little bit. Some of us have. Um, once I describe it, I think that you'll be like, oh, yeah, yep, yep. I know what that is. It sucks. Um, is that mandatory minimum sentencing laws force a judge to hand down a minimum prison sentence based on the charges, the prosecution, right? So the person who was filing the, you know, case versus the defendant. So usually it's some, it's the, the police department or it's, uh, it's the state. Uh, and so it brings a defendant, uh, which results in a conviction, usually a guilty plea. Plea bargains are what I call Satan um, because it is always in the context of folks who do not have the means to fight the good Lord's fight in court because either A, they still have to work to survive, B, they don't have the money to afford um, judges uh, to, or not judges, my bad, lawyers to um, fight for why they are just not, they're being wrongfully convicted. And uh, see a lot of times that when they are appointed pro bono lawyers, the pro bono lawyers are just pushing them to the plea bargain to be like, hey, unless you wanna go to jail for 20 years, just accept the guilty and accept five years instead, which would still mean that you are accepting that you are guilty for the crime, even if you are not, you just don't want the, the maximum sentence, so you plea. It is very much so executed onto folks who do not have the means to fight the criminal justice system, which is why I call it Satan. But um, mandatory minimum sentencing takes out considerations of circumstance of the crime and characteristics of the individual. So like, let's say, uh, oh, Siri, calm down. Let's say that you are driving, some of y'all drive, that some of y'all uh, are driving, the police officer pulls you over, and you are found, let's say you're not in California either, because California is a little different, 
but let's say you're in like South Dakota uh, and then a police officer pulls you over and finds like let's say a gram or whatever quantity of um, marijuana on your possession. That state has a kind of has a rule, has a law that's in place for after a certain amount or either A, it's just illegal and therefore there is a already an automatic sentencing uh, or charge, however the state's kind of law is set in place for what the violation would be that could put you in jail. There are a lot of folks who are in prison right now for marijuana, uh, even though in a lot of states there are there is some legalization measure. But let's say that's your situation. Uh, you go to court. They say maximum is five years or like, let's say 10 years. They say, okay, you know what? Uh, we're not going to base it off of the fact that you are an upstanding citizen, that you have a job, that you are the head of the household, that like, you know, it wasn't yours or just something, like, stuff like that. Mandatory minimum sentencing does not look at any of those things. So while people are coming up to justify your character, to talk about why you are a good person, none of that is taken into a consideration with these mandatory minimum sentencing laws because they are set in place and why the prosecution, when they bring it up to you, are wielding a lot of power because it takes the judge's kind of ability to kind of intervene away because they cannot base the ruling. They're basically, they're ruling yes or no. They're not ruling, okay, let's like change some things up. They're like, no, this quantity is this many years. Either you accept the plea or you don't. Goodbye. Very wild reality that we live in with that. And that uh, Congress, um, with the mandatory minimum sentencing, abandoned the idea that federal judges uh, appointed by the president and confirmed by the US Senate have the wisdom and training to identify the most uh, serious drug offenders and punish them appropriately. Um, and that this authority has been limited uh, by the Sentencing Reform Act of 1984 and predecessing uh, sentencing laws um, after, but that that kind of disparity in sentencing um, still exists now because it still relies on some kind of logic of a, a floor and ceiling to uh, violations and sentencing requirements uh, that is still targeted to um, mainly, primarily black and brown folks. Uh, continued, da 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 da, a TLDR, if you needed one, is that mandatory sentencing laws have the effect of transferring sentencing power from judges to prosecutors, um, and that they've been misused by the DOJ because they are frequently directed against low level offenders, folks who don't have money, folks who have already, you know, been in the court system who have set up in the eyes of the law a precedent to break the law. And so therefore, it's just one of those money-making mechanisms for the state to put you in prison because it make the, it, the state makes money by putting folks in jail cells. Like that is just like part of how the federal government gives a budget to states in the particular context of the prison system, which means that, and we've seen the, the, the police department budgets We've seen that, just imagine the budgets that are given to federally run and state run prisons. There are a lot, and so they wanna keep that system going. Something that keeps those sentence, that system going is mandatory minimum sentencing laws because they can deck someone who has very low ability to defend themselves, because low level offenders, right? Like, I, I, very dime bags, small amounts, now you're serving very long sentences and you can do nothing about it. That long sentence has been a very cashed out check uh, for the, like, they asked somebody for 15 years who like that's a prison cell that has to get paid for by who? The government, who gives them the money, the federal government. And that money is like consistently there because now you are stuck there for 15 years. Like it's a, in the context of capitalism, it's the perfect system. Um, but what about reforms? So there have been some minor uh, reforms that have taken place in the context of um, sentencing. There was the um, PROTECT Act, which was originally drafted to provide a stronger protections for children in abduction and sexual exploitation cases uh, with other tools to protect children. The addition of the restrictions on judicial discretion over sentencing 
was a later addition by Representative Tom Feeney of Florida. He passed in 2004 on April 30th. Um, and it acted as a foundation for sentencing guidelines into 2004, so 2009, with Booker and Blakey. Now, I don't, I'm not going to get into the back and forth, like I said, of like all oh, these different laws that were passed and kind of to augment small, tiny things. Just kind of where are we now? The common, the current era of sentencing, i.e. post Booker and Blakey, is that it's an attempt to use the federal guidelines as an advisory guide and to, to basically analyze and compile decisions for all crimes and their sentences to create a sense of common law that creates a presumptive range for what an appropriate sentence would entail. Basically, it's like there are federal guidelines. We have created them. States, we have at least given you something to enforce. States still get to choose whether or not they enforce those, get, those guidelines that, have the, that the federal government has kind of given to the states. Because once again, the 10th Amendment means that states don't have to comply with federal guidelines. All they have to do is prove a basis for why they are in interpretation of, you know, operating within whatever the guidelines were for how sentencing can operate because they still want their money from the government. They still want that. So they're going to do enough to guarantee those fundings. So, First Step Act, uh, I hate to say it, but like the way that y'all probably know it is through some K-U-W-T-K, some keeping up with the Kardashians, some yay business, um, trash, but uh, 2018, Congress passed the First Step Act. Uh, the purpose was to shorten sentences and improve conditions for incarcerated persons. This was an issue of recidivism. Right. And so this is the idea that when you leave jail, what are the opportunities that are given to um, freed uh, persons? And usually it's that they don't have that many opportunities because there's a lot of um, laws that are not laws that are put in place, but just how like companies and different hiring processes operate is that if you have a felony charge, uh, on you, it means that you disqualify automatically for certain services. Um, and also this affects things such as healthcare, affects things such as jobs, which is like sad. It affects things such as like um, housing. Because if you've been in prison for let's say 15 years, you have missed out on very critical, you know, aspects of being in the, you know, civil society in the world to make money. You don't leave prison and all of a sudden have money. It just, I, unless like you were, from a trust fund situation or your family just has money so that right when you leave, you have the means and the resources. The reality is that if they're low offenders that are getting decked into prisons and they come out, they didn't have the money before and they sure don't have the money after. And so usually they return back into the prison, and prison system because either A, it just is cheaper for them to be in prison, which is a sad thing to say, cheaper to be in prison and you at least can have an apportioned meal and do some kind of labor for pennies than to be out in civil society where you are not given anything, right? And so the idea is also just that and that folks who have been imprisoned and taken out of civil society, when they return to civil society are more likely to return back to a life of crime. And I'm very careful to put crime in um, parentheses uh, because crime is very racialized, um, but yeah. First Step Act was meant to kind of help with providing resources and to shortening um, sentences to allow, to, to push back on recidivism, uh, i.e. going back to prison. Policing, 12. I won't say what I think, but um, I feel like y'all know how I feel is that it begins with no and it begins with goodbye. It might begin with abolish it might begin with a lot of other letters, but I don't like 12, I don't like police, I don't think they do a darn thing that helps and serves citizens. But that's just me, maybe you feel differently. George Floyd, oh mercy. I know everybody here has heard of George Floyd. Everybody seen, I wanna kinda look at, can I get like a confirmation? Can I get the zoom hand? If you know how to do the zoom hand, how many of us know, have heard about this case, you have not been living under a rock. I want to see where the where the hands at. Wait, oh, okay, wait. I want to see. Yup, 
Yup. Yeah, I see not. I see some people not doing it. Okay. Yep. 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 George Floyd. Ha. Huh. Okay. So eight minutes and forty six seconds. This is how long Officer Derek Chauvin had his knee on George Floyd's neck after police were called for a complaint that Mr. Floyd had a counterfeit twenty dollar bill to buy cigarettes something that has not even been confirmed. It was just a assumption slash a complaint that was brought to the police that brought them to the scene. Now, the day after uh, Mr. Floyd's death, the police department fired all four of the officers involved in the episode, um, but, uh, and, and announced third degree murder charges for Chauvin, but none of those officers have been convicted. And actually their trial date is not even until March of 2021. So for all intents and purposes, these folks who have murdered uh, um, a civilian, an individual, somebody who could be me, somebody who could be you, somebody who could just be black and living, brown and living, um, do not face the law or um, any kind of means of justice until a year from now. And it's not guaranteed that they will be convicted of the crime because there is a thing such as immunity that, um, officers have, that we'll talk about in a little bit, um, that allows for this long and drawn out process to get folks or to get officers convicted of crimes and thrown into prisons, right? Because like, you know, what's crime? Once again, it is racialized because murder looks to me the same way as murder to anything else. But some, for some reason, this gets to be able to change because the officer is in a uniform and protected by the state, protected by the government to have some justification to kill people. Um, Breonna Taylor, how many of us have heard her name? Once again, zoom hand for me so that I can see where I'm at, who, who's heard, where am I? Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. The officers in her case have not been arrested to this day. It has been months, months, and her officers are still not been arrested. What's the story, Jasmine? Great. It is that she is an e she was an EMT, an aspiring nurse, well respected in her community, right? Um, and she was killed by police while sleeping in her home. Um, Officers were called uh, to do an investigation on a drug for a drug raid, and they came dressed in regular clothing at the you know the dark of the night. Um, and that her boyfriend, who was also with her, asked who it was. No one responded, and all he could see were folks who were you know very dimly lit in the darkness, dressed not in police clothing. And any person, and like where they were living too, you know, it's not like a, oh, I'm just gonna assume that it's my neighborhood police just checking in to ask for some sugar. No, um, any person who would see that is going to naturally go into self-defense mode. And it's not even that her boyfriend went into like a, and it's horrible that I have to even create these justifications to like, or to say, and he didn't even do enough to justify because nothing justifies this. But he, um, in self-defense, is like, all right, these random assailants are outside of my property, your home that you own. What are you going to do? You're going to defend yourself, at least have a gun. Officers who are not seeing any part of this, no one's responding, no one's letting them in, decide to fire off shots. Eight shots, um, or she was shot eight times by police in her sleep, in her bed. Um, and it's hard for me sometimes to tell, you know, to, to, to talk about, um, instances like this as it is exhausting for a lot of black people to just be affected and hear the narratives of other black folks being murdered and killed, indigenous folks being murdered and killed. Um, and it, it just, it's, it's hard, right? Because it begins that little rabbit hole of what justifies murder? What justifies death? What are we doing? Why are we even playing the justification game when you are sleeping in your bed that you can be shot? 
I don't know if y'all know the story of um, Ayanna Stanley Jones, but very similar situation happens there where she shot on the couch, a six year old girl minding her business, which the officers later found that they were at the wrong house at the wrong time and conviction status there, nowhere. It's one of those things where black folks are just existing in the world and it's ongoing to be on alert for the immunity that officers are given to police their communities. And one little, uh, one more little uh, fact um, about the officers in the Breonna Taylor case is that they went to the wrong home. They went to the wrong home, but because uh, Kentucky has these kind of like, um, what are, what are they called? They are, um, what is that? They are uh, the cracking no down on gentrification rules. They kind of want it to have a justification just to go in the neighborhood and area of what is assumed to be, you know, low property value homes and to police them uh, whenever and however to create this kind of environment where black folks don't want to stay. And so they knew they went to the wrong house. It was intentional to go to a wrong house and going to the wrong house has led to a murder of a civilian of an aspiring nurse, ENT. So that's the state that we live in with policing. And so a timeline for policing, its evolution, you got it, does definitely start uh, with prisons, or not prisons, LOL, uh, with slavery, um, informal night watches, slave patrols, your modern, well, your historical police, who are there to capture runaway slaves uh, and bring them back to the plantations that owned them, that this was the inception, day watches, municipal police forces. And I wanna be very, very like uh, clear is that a lot of these things weren't even state sanctioned. They were, pri they were privately owned and allowed to enforce kind of societal expectations that were detain black people. They do not have the right to live. And that same kind of justification for policing is what has entered us into um, modern day policing. They would argue that, oh, we've changed it. These police are not the same as those. But the logic and how the law has been written to justify immunity, justify this argument for why blue lives are different than just lives, uh, is because we have created this kind of milita militant and state-based force that justifies killing of folks. Uh, and the concept of qualified immunity is just that, is that they have, um, they have immunity based on their job occupation that is protected by the government and states. Um, because they are not seen as civilians, they operate on a very much similar level as like military folks which in my mind is ridiculous. And in, uh, in just, I was gonna go on a tangent with the military, but they get uh, qualified immunity there. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of policing and that's very applicable to you all is school to prison pipeline. Um, that is something that is very real. If you, are, if you go to a school, uh, I know that the um, uh, OUSD has, uh, ended its contract with the Oakland uh, police, which like big woot to that, but also, and I think, was it, did San Francisco also do that? I believe so. Yes. I don't know about where LA is uh, with that, but LA, LA uh, the fact is that police uh, schools having contracts with their police departments to police schools and not just like police with like the batons, but police with full grade weaponry, um, and I call it weaponry because that's exactly what it is. These are 16 year olds, 15 year olds, 14 year olds trying to learn, but also at the same time living in a police state in their school. But the school to prison pipeline refers to a national trend in which school policies and practices are directly and indirectly pushing students out of school and on a pathway to prison. Um, 
and the punishment applies regardless of circumstances. This sounds similar to what I brought up earlier in terms of mandatory minimum sentencing, that it always falls in the power of the prosecution to just bring up the charge. Um, this kind of logic of uh, punishment being uh, being needed regardless of the character is something that is endemic. Uh, within criminal legal systems because it supposes that you are already criminal and therefore the legal system follows that. Um, but the does not take into account reasons for behavior such as self-defense or the student's history of disciplinary problems. And uh, this these policies were not just like post facto, just kind of existing in the world that, you know, some schools try, you know, some schools chose to do and some chose schools not to do, but what were written into school handbooks in the 1990s. Like, this is how you should deal with kids who do X, Y, and Z things, and it is justified uh, because they are trying to bring in a, the broken windows theory, which in my mind has two different definitions. The one that they are subscribing to is that uh, you need to be hardlined on punishment to get folks to correct bad behaviors at home. So there's already been an assumption made by how kids in particular neighborhoods and areas are being raised and need to be corrected uh, when they come to school because they have not been in, they have not been shown anything outside of that. And for me, obscene and also they don't know how black family structures work in which there is not an issue with, you know, Teaching your, your your child, your student, your kid, how to be an upstanding citizen is not uh, related to the environment that they are raised in. But those assumptions are being made with the school to prison pipeline, police brutality cases, um, read the facts, quite obscene, right? That uh, since 2005, only 35 officers have been convicted of a crime related to an on-duty fatal shooting um, each year in the United States. And this is what is recorded. I cannot say this more than I can possibly say it with my mouth, is that this is based off of data that is recorded, not things that are not, but that somewhere between 900 and 1,000 people are shot and killed by, by police. And often a lesser offense such as manslaughter or negligent homicide rather than murder. So like an example of manslaughter could just be like, um, hmm, like hitting somebody, like a, like a hit and run, right? But like, let's say someone ran in front of the car and you hit them, that's technically manslaughter. There was no intent to necessarily uh, kill them, but that murder slash, not kill it, we can't say murder, but um, a life is lost via your action. But the intent, is not being tracked here. And that's a lot of the times when officers, if they are convicted or charged with anything, that's what they are being charged or convicted of, is manslaughter, which is like, but they chose to shoot someone who they thought was a, you know, um, threat, when in fact, it was just a hairbrush and not a gun, Jonathan. And I'm sorry if there's a Jonathan in the chat, that's just the first name that I thought of when I thought of a white man in a blue suit. Um, forensic science, the last thing I know y'all like, oh my gosh, she's doing too much. Uh, how are y'all though? How are we feeling? Are we feeling good? Are things making sense? I love to kind of have conversations with y'all, um, kind of in, in between conversation. Give me, give me the zoom thumb, give me something, just give me something. How are we doing? Yeah. Okay. Some of you may or may not be in the chat. That's fine. Online learning is fun. This is recorded though, so you get to return to this if you need to refer back to some things. So just know that you have this as a resource for my for my friends out here who are whose videos are turned off and I'm sure have walked away. It's okay though. I understand. Uh, um, forensic science. Uh, I wanted to talk about a very um, interesting court case. Uh, that happened with the Supreme Court, and it's the Williams versus Illinois uh, case, and it deals with, um, I, I don't, I, I didn't think to do trigger warnings at the beginning of this, because I'm very um, careful about how I'm describing things, but it is uh, in the context of 
uh, rape. What I'm going to what I'm going to talk about though is not necessarily focused in on that. It's more of the DNA samplings and how that is used. But if that is something that is not uh, comfortable for you, I very much so want to give you the time to like mute me uh, so that you don't listen into this. Um, and then I'll do like when I'm done uh, talking about it so that you can enter back into the chat. So a very clear visual move will indicate when I am done uh, mentioning uh, this case, um, if it is something that is not comfortable slash triggering uh, to you, I do not want to be participant in that. Okay, so the Williams versus Illinois, uh, 2012, June 18th. Uh, I'm not talking about the incident uh, because there was not an incident, uh, but uh, this man was convicted, this black man was convicted of assault, rape, and the victim identified him as her attacker. Now, I don't want to tell you what her racial makeup was, but I think maybe you can assume what I'm going for here as what her racial makeup was. Um, so, okay. Um, but identified him as her attacker, both in a lineup and at trial, um, and y'all, these things are so subjective, but you can have a lineup and be like, him, he's the one. And we've definitely seen how folks kind of homogenize what black faces uh, look like, where they're like, oh, they all look the same, so I'm just gonna say that one. The lineup is a very racially charged assumption that you're able to clearly identify who uh, was your assailant, especially when you can't give particularly, especially when it's not between folks who knew each other, right? If it's like against like strangers, that's when things get complicated. Um, but the lineup is a way that folks are able, the uh, victim is able to, if it is given to them as an opportunity to do, to pick, because also victims are able to pick and choose whether or not they want to do that, because it could be something that is, um, I don't want to say triggering, but like also that, but also you don't want to be in the same space as somebody who potentially um, assaulted you, right? Um, but um, she testified, um, but she brought, there was a DNA expert who's on the side of um, the prosecution um, expert uh, who testified that she compared William, Williams' DNA with a profile compiled by an accredited laboratory, this is Cellmark, based on semen deposited during uh, the rape. Now, I want to first begin, and I, I, I'm going to actually, no, I'm going to say some things after this case, and then this lecture will be over, about how forensic science, I don't want to say it's not real science, but like, it's not, the forensic scientists are not scientists, right? The, and, and why I'm saying this is that the protocol that they follow in terms of collecting information data uh, for showing um, you know, comparative objectivity for cases is not the same as like a laboratory for like scientists uh, who are like, for example, trying to get a cure together for COVID, right? There's like a certain trial error time to, and like the amount of time that stuff takes in order for DNA to be confirmed uh, to be true or just the different like insert sciencey things that I'm not quite, you know, the authority to speak on. Um, but that, that's a different level of science uh, scientist-like nature that is going on to get samples and to get information versus what forensic scientists um, are more so doing narrative style science, right? Um, and so I just want to make sure that like, it's still science, I don't want to say it's not, but in terms of timelines and how long they have to bring that science to the courts, they, it's a quicker timeline and so therefore there's definitely room for error. But just wanted to say that. So the Supreme Court uh, rule of the, plural, the plurality noted that courts have long permitted experts to testify based on facts, not within their own personal knowledge. So the DNA expert uh, did not conduct or do the cross comparison in DNA, right, at, at all. Like she took it uh, to, um, she saw the DNA profile um, of Williams and then just so happened to know that the company had this other profile that they, the company had no relationship to the case and took his profile, went to the catalog and was like, hmm, there seems to be a similarity. Ding, 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 ding. So that, that uh, laboratory was not necessarily involved in the criminal, in the 
in the trial, in trying to convict or to corroborate evidence to support his conviction. Um, and so the Supreme Court ruled that because the, the, the laboratory, Cellmark DNA, did not have the intent to um, uh, assert the truth, right? So like prove, uh, to, to seek to prove Williams as being a guilty, but just so happened to have this profile um, that um, it was allowed to stay in the court. So like it was able to be allowed even outside of the confrontation clause because the confrontation clause largely is just like, there are some, there's some wishy-washy stuff going on here in terms of cell mark or external laboratory science um, having kind of um, a, a goal or a bias with presenting data. Um, but also the secondary part to that is that the DNA expert didn't even have to explain um, how the laboratory did the science. Didn't have to explain how they found a match. Didn't have to explain how they decided uh, the DNA was comparatively similar. All she had to do was this, this laboratory has a profile and it matches the profile of Williams. Here is the conclusion. None of that, no conversation of here's the, here's the study, here's how the things were done. None of that matched with the fact that she was a DNA expert who did not do any of the, of the science portions. So therefore, the idea of using evidence not within your expertise for the jury to just listen to, oh, PhD, she's smart. I'm gonna believe her because P doctor's telling me some things. So I'm gonna believe doctor, but not the fact that how this evidence was put together, there might be some questions, right? There, there, there's not enough uh, evidence, at least that is being accepted in the trial or asked for to corroborate DNA evidence as being um, similar to Williams. Just like, here's the conclusion. Okay, I got questions. Oh, you don't have, you don't have to ask me those questions? Perfect, guilty. So that's how forensic science has been used. Uh, our, you can also, uh, actually I'll, I'll get into the, the stuff here to say that. So one is that it's that new, new science. It's relatively new phenomena in uh, CJR, CJ or uh, criminal legal system, CLS. Um, for a variety of reasons, but most notably is that science didn't really uh, exist until, or that the science didn't uh, recently, didn't exist until recently. Sorry, words are hard, y'all. Um, and this is where a lot of controversy in this section falls because most of the issues with forensic science have to do with creating verifiable. So remember that whole like, how did you conduct the trial to assess whether or not there is similarities in DNA, how, what's going on here? None of those questions are being asked. You're just presenting a conclusion. Um, is that a lot of this has not been verifiable. It is just like DNA is collected uh, from folks and that even a small tracing of DNA could be a justification for why a person is guilty. So let's say like the crime scene, right? Happens and like a crime is committed on the street. There's like some DNA let's go like they, they mark it off and they find like a small DNA sample, like a hair follicle or someone who was there at a time that was maybe three hours before when the crime was convicted, when the crime was committed, right? Technically that DNA could place somebody in the room when they were not there for the crime. But that, 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 that information, that stuff could be used against them because forensic, like that's, and that's like the, where is the verifiability to pinpoint the correct person via DNA for the crime is almost impossible. Or is that because science is revered, which it should be, right, um, to present some objectivity, but that the way in which science is used, which is why it's forensic science for criminal systems, how it is used is where human error and biases and like the narrative of criminalization becomes textured with how uh, DNA, uh, you know, science, biology is being used to convict people. 
And there's two major categories, DNA testing um, and matching and drug forensics. The matching part is the uh, case study that I brought above to y'all, right? With like, a, they just had this profile because y'all, I hate to break it to you. If you've ever done like a criminal or not criminal background check where you done one of these, if you've gone to the, uh, the, the doctor where they've asked for fair, they've done, your DNA is tracked somewhere. And they have pro, and different laboratories have profiles. It's a sad world, but we're being surveilled. So like there is some company that has like, not some company, just like the places that you have gone that have a database for you, have a database for you. And that's like a DNA expert for some reason going to, like they can't go to the hospitals because of Hippocratic Oath, right? But like depending on where you gave your data or where your DNA was asked for, uh, that could be used to corroborate you into a crime. It's a wild, wild place. Um, oh, and big recommend if you have parent permission. So like, I put that in there. So I'm like, oh, well, Jasmine told me that I could, I said with parent permission. So that's what record, recording got me saying parent permission. Uh, there's a Netflix documentary to how to fix a drug scandal, which focuses on two major cases of drug forensic lab mismanagement slash inadequate testing, which is going to show you the debate on how verifiable forensic science is in being able to make conclusive statements that are facts. And I believe... <laughs>